from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 37, recorded on September 13th, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dong. Hopefully you remember me from my <laughs> long pause, but welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Well, well welcome back, Sarah. I was I was getting a bit worried, you know, and I think <laughs> we all missed you. What 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 was happening? What are you doing? <laughs> yes, thank you for everyone who um reached out or checked in. So Uh, For those who didn't know, I was still in training, so I I graduated and I moved, so I'm now at Emory, which is in Atlanta, um, and was just a bit burnt out and had an opportunity to take some time off, so my husband and I uh, traveled and were out of the country for a while, but now we're back in action and, um, yeah, ready to get back to PUSCAS and, and regular life. And you're... But I feel like you have to take advantage of those times <laughs> that you have off. <laughs> I feel like in medical training, there basically are uh, very few built-in spaces for a time like that. No, that's that's true. So I, I think good, good, uh, good mental and other self uh, health focus <laughs> there. So hopefully, uh, our listeners will uh, model that. You're a good role model. And now you're <laughs> now you're a full fledged official what transplant ID attending. I am. I'm a. Uh, real attending now, which seems kind of crazy. I have my first block as an attending starting later this week. So, okay. I guess ask me on the other side. <laughs> well, if you get into oh, trouble, wait. my only bit of advice is remember that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio movie, Catch Me If You Can. So, when one person sort of presents something and you're not quite sure, just turn to the second. Do you concur with your colleague? And then you get pause. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ask a friend. That is definitely the model that I'm going to use. All right. Uh, well. Well, yeah, let's jump in. Fuscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. And on to the literature, shall we? All right. Well, we will start with viral. And uh, remember to listen to This Week in Virology. Uh, thanks for everyone who's sort of hanging out with us still. It's nice to see people are still listening. And actually, it seems like the listeners are up a little bit. Not sure what that could be triggered by. But anyway, the article, The Association Between Varicella Zoster Virus and Dementia, a systematic review and meta-analysis of observational studies was recently published in the journal Neurological Sciences. Uh, a theme here for those following this field, uh, here the authors conducted an extensive meta-analysis and ultimately um, considered nine studies involving 3 million 326,673 subjects. They found that VZV, varicella zoster virus infection, was associated with an increased risk of dementia with a hazard ratio of 1.11. Now, the 95% confidence interval is 1.02 to 1.21. Remember, 3 million people to show this subtle impact. So the risk of dementia was reduced in those who received antiviral therapy compared to those who did not. And that actually was a hazard ratio of 0.84, so a 16% reduction uh, with regard to your risk of dementia if you actually get treated. All right. A little bit later in this episode, we will discuss an article suggesting the complexity along with the low reimbursement. Welcome, Sarah. Um, <laughs> and uh, these being perhaps what keep people from pursuing the most interesting of all fields, infectious disease. But call me the optimist when I see vaccines as potentially simplifying our field. What could be easier than just preventing disease with an effective vaccine? Well, the article, Safety, Efficacy, and Immunogenicity of a Replication-Defective Human Cytomegalovirus Vaccine V160 in Cytomegalovirus Seronegative Women, a Double-Blind Randomized Placebo-Controlled Phase 2B Trial. Unfortunately, this is a swing and a miss. This was published in The Lancet. Um, this Phase 2B Randomized Double-Blind Placebo-Controlled study was conducted in 90 sites in seven countries, USA, Finland, Canada, 
Israel, Spain, Russia, and Australia. They assess the safety and efficacy of a replication defective investigational CMV vaccine. And unfortunately, while well-tolerated and immunogenetic, immunogenic, three doses of the vaccine did not reduce the incidence of primary CMV infection in CMV seronegative women compared with placebo. Now, I sort of pause. Is, is that the right bar? Should it really be primary CMV infection? Should there be some other parameter? Not sure, but at least this analysis is a swing and a miss. Um, my next one's a, a little bit different. I read microorganisms detected in intussusception cases and controls in children less than three years old in South Africa from 2013 to 2017 in OFID. Um so some people may already know this, but the possible trigger for intussusception is not completely known. There's definitely been some associations that have been reported in the literature, including adenovirus, HHV6, and rotavirus. Um, I actually, sorry, rotavirus vaccine. Um, I didn't know this, but there was a um, intussusception uh, surveillance established in South Africa after introduction of the monovalent rotavirus vaccine in 2009. And in that group, they found that the risk of intussusception three weeks after the vaccine was not higher than the background risk. Um, but there were some concerns about delayed presentations. So the authors did this study really to look into other potential infectious etiologies in this specific groups of South African children by looking at the stool surveillance cultures and testing that they were collecting. And so they had an expanded uh, panel of organisms. And so these were young children under the age of three, as the title said, and they compared children who had an episode of intussusception versus control. So hospitalized children um, who were hospitalized for non intussusception related surgery, and they did some matching by age and um, date of admission and so on. They ended up having about a little under 400 stool specimens from the children who had intussusception and 235 stool specimens from the controls. And the median number of microorganisms detected was two. There wasn't a difference really between the cases and controls as far as, far as the organism. So the most frequent was a uh, human adenovirus, which is 45%. Uh, C. diff was isolated in 22%. Enterovirus, 21%. Rotavirus, 12%. So those are sort of the top four. Um, sort of the author's take home were that these intussusception cases were more likely to have um, adenovirus detected, specifically adenovirus type C. Um, those patients were almost three times more likely to be detected um, in the cases group versus the controls. Um, and actually, apparently, some of the cases had detection of adenovirus and resected lymph nodes in the patients who did have surgery for intussusception. Um, so it goes along with some data pointing towards adenovirus, but didn't really find much of a relationship as far as some of the other bugs that have been mentioned, like HHV6. So a very specific population, but I thought this was interesting because I kind of feel like that question of uh, ID associations with intussusception seems like a tested topic a lot of times. And actually, I, I think we still don't totally know um, what the trigger is and what is what is the combination? Like, is it that they're getting the rotavirus vaccine? Is it that they get the rotavirus vaccine and an infection? Um, but yeah, pretty interesting. It's actually, I, have, I mean, I sort of agree with you. A lot of times I worry about a test question based upon maybe data that really hasn't panned out, right? We we all have in our head, you know, rotavirus vaccine in a susception. But here, kind of calling into question, um, is this association actually really there? Yeah. All right, bacterial, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. And let me start this section with the brief report. I mean, I love this one, actually. Everyone, you got to read this. But Clinician Testing and Treatment Thresholds for Management of Urinary Tract Infection Published in Open Form Infectious Disease. So here, they conduct a study where despite the fact that a diagnosis of UTI requires dysuria, urinary frequency, urgency, suprapubic or flank pain, they ask a whole bunch of providers if they would go ahead and treat asymptomatic bacteria with unnecessary antibiotics 
if the urine had a bad smell. Turns out most providers are quick to provide those unnecessary antibiotics. And apparently being an older physician or a mid-level is associated with the lowest threshold for whipping out those unnecessary antibiotics. <laughs> I have to read. I haven't read that one. <laughs> it's, it's very, I mean, I got to say, it's very interesting. So what they do is they, they present this scenario like, okay, so here's this individual, asymptomatic bacteria, foul smelling urine. And then, you know, so you're like, okay, I'm done. Asymptomatic bacteria. I'm walking away. They're like, okay, but what if I told you there was a 19% chance that they actually had a UTI? Would you treat them? I'm still walking away, but apparently some people are like, ooh, I might, I might do that. Some people 45, some people 60%, and they keep changing this and getting like different people to jump in. I'm like, okay, oh, if you say it's that high, and I'm like, are you missing the clinical vignette? They said asymptomatic <laughs> bacteria. Did you miss that? <laughs> so I, I uh. just, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Now the next article. This one actually was, I thought, rather interesting as well. The article, Clinical Outcomes and Management of NAT Positive Toxin Negative C. diff Infection, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis published in CID. So many centers have switched over to an approach where they only treat an identified C. diff detection if they detect toxin, right? So it's sort of this two-step thing. Um, the whole idea seems to make sense is to restrict treatment to toxin producing C. diff, right? Person, if they have diarrhea and it's really from the C. diff, well, there should be a toxin. You should be able to pick it up. Now, here the investigators evaluated clinical outcomes of patients who were NAT positive, toxin positive versus NAT positive, toxin negative, but treated versus untreated NAT positive, toxin negative cases. And I was surprised here, but they report that for the NAT positive toxin negative cases treated compared to untreated, the all-cause 30-day mortality was 5% versus 12.7%. Hmm. All right. Kind of shocking to me. I'm still trying to sort out what that actually means. Yeah. Um, and for the next one, I, I end up pulling another... A pediatric paper from JPEDS, uh, Associations of Standard Care, Intrathecal Antibiotics, and Antibiotic Impregnated Catheters with Cerebrospinal Fluid Shunt Infection Organisms and Resistance. Whew. So <laughs> the bottom line here was that the authors found no association between the infection prevention techniques, meaning antibiotic impregnated shunt catheters, intrathecal antibiotics, both or standard of care, and the subsequent first CSF shunt infecting organisms and this retrospective cohort of over 1,700, 1,700 children. Um, so their hypothesis was that exposure to these intrathecal antibiotics or the antibiotic impregnated shunt catheters uh, would be an association with higher odds of a gram-negative infection and subsequent infections compared to standard of care because the most commonly used intrathecal antibiotics are vancomycin and gentamicin, and the impregnated catheters generally use clindamycin and rifampin. And then they also had the question of whether the use of intrathecal antibiotics would be associated with greater resistance to those drugs in the patients who later had an infection in the future. Um, so this was retrospective observational cohort. They used uh, data from the FIS database, so the Pediatric Health Information System Plus. Uh, so essentially, this is six tertiary care children's hospitals in the U.S. And so they enter children entered the cohort at the time of their initial CSF shunt procedure, and for the most part, they were followed for at least three years. About mm -hmm. two thirds of the patients had an infection after their initial shunt, and about one the other third had it after revision. Not too surprisingly, Quag negative staph and staph aureus were the most common single organisms, but they did have a lot of polymicrobial infections reported, so over 40% of their um, group. And so the authors concluded that, you know. These decisions on exactly which infection prevention technique you use um, probably should be based on a variety of factors, thinking about the patients and costs and availability, since it didn't seem like these made a uh, direct impact. 
um, you know, this is slightly older data, I think just based on the database that it's pulled from. But even if you suggest like, oh, the resistance patterns have been changing and it's different now than it was a decade ago, I think the idea would be that the impact of these infection prevention techniques causing resistance likely wouldn't change. And so if it didn't make a, a huge difference back then, it ideally wouldn't now. So that's quite quite interesting. It's kind of an infection control question that is separate than sort of how we manage them in the hospital as ID docs and sort of seeing them. But I think a lot of folks in ID have their, you know, other other hats in infection prevention. So I thought this was a cool study. Okay. Well, I don't know. While you were gone, Sarah, I, I should probably <laughs> mention that the, the world has gotten rosy. Inappropriate antibiotic prescribing has pretty much vanished from the landscape, mm. except... <laughs> Apparently, I read this article, Antibiotics on Demand, <laughs> Advances in Asynchronous Telemedicine Call for Increased Antibiotic Surveillance, published in CID, and this has me a bit worried. Now, I understand the business model, but what about that oath and doing the right thing professionally rather than rushing us all toward the antimicrobial-resistant apocalypse? Here, we read about the firsthand experiences with two direct-to-consumer platforms where the authors, authors intentionally sought inappropriate antibiotic prescriptions for nonspecific symptoms. Strongly, like secret shoppers. <laughs> basically, <laughs> secret evil shoppers. <laughs> trying to get inappropriate sure. antibiotic prescriptions for nonspecific symptoms is strongly indicative of a viral upper respiratory infection. Despite the lack of of clear necessity, they requested antibiotic prescriptions which were readily transmitted to a local pharmacy following a simple monetary transaction. The authors point out that this effortless acquisition of patient-selected antibiotics online, devoid of personal interactions or consultations, underscores the urgent imperative for intensified antimicrobial stewardship initiatives led by state and national public health organizations in telehealth settings. Well, I just wanted to step in you know, a little bit on my soapbox and share a, a disturbing experience that I, that I had recently that actually led me to uh, vent to one of my partners. I'm sitting in the ER, one of the hospitals that will remain uh, nameless, um, and I overhear um, a provider, we will not mention which level this provider is, um, but they call up and they say, oh, I was just reviewing your laboratory data from your visit the other day here in the ER. No, 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 I understand you had no urinary symptoms, but the urinary culture grew some back to, no, no, I understand you have no symptoms, but I understand your, your urine culture grew some bacteria and I don't want to leave that untreated. Have you heard, have you heard of Cipro? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. It's not the fly on the wall <laughs> <laughs> conversation that I'd want to hear. All right. Oh. Well, this next one I pulled, I tried to if we've talked about something on prior episodes and it feels like a little bit of a follow-up, um, pull them in. So this one's from J Journal of Infectious Disease. Uh, two artificial tears outbreak associated cases of extensively drug resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa detected through whole genome sequencing based surveillance. Um, so this article included two cases caused by the recent nationwide outbreak of contaminated artificial tears. Um, before this outbreak was noted in February, this um, VIMP, Verona Integron Encoded Metallobetalactamase, GES, this extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa, had not been detected in the U.S., um, so the paper describes the University of Pittsburgh's identification of the outbreak strain um, at their site with the use of whole genome sequencing surveillance, um, and they have a control program called the Enhanced Detection System for Healthcare Associated Transmission, uh, which is an ongoing surveillance program. Um, and they sort of plugged in what the CDC had provided for the genetic information that was available. And I think it's just a really cool example of what probably could be accomplished with whole genome sequencing. And then, of course, in a perfect world where we like shared um, medical sort of outbreak information that 
um, this is an example of what we could do. And so I recommend people check it out. I think I, um, I, I am inspired a little bit by all the cool things that people are doing, even though it's not usually in my (laughs) day to day wheelhouse, but you know, if this is something that's more widely available in the future for products like this that are sort of just like in the community where patients can get it at a store, you know, could we more rapidly identify outbreaks and cases, particularly across like larger geographic areas, if we sort of were able to sync up these types of systems that currently probably exist a little bit in, in isolation from one another. Um, all right. And then this next one I am going to share is from CID, uh, pre-XDR congenital TB in an extremely premature baby. And this case is um, a 940-gram baby who was born at 26 weeks gestation. Mom was found to have chronic active necrotizing granulomatous endometritis, which was consistent with TB about 90s after delivery, and then basically had a subsequent workup that showed she had disseminated TB with miliary pulmonary nodules and TB meningitis. And so the newborn baby by two weeks of age had their evaluation for congenital TB, um, which, you know, is rare. um, But I think the the significance of this is all the drugs that they were, the the therapy they provided to this baby. So um, I'll just sort of walk through because I think it's so interesting. They started first with the isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and moxifloxacin. You got a little bit more information back from mom that showed an RPOB gene mutation along with some other additional mutations um, associated with resistance to isoniazid and fluoroquinolones. So then the baby's treatment gets adjusted to linazolid, cyclosarine, prothionamide, and amikacin. And then the amikacin later gets replaced by delaminid through compassionate use. And then they finally get the susceptibility testing later that showed resistance to isoniazid, rifampin, fluoroquinolones, um, ethambutol, pyrazinamide. So the eventually the moxifloxacin and prothionamide was replaced by clofazamine and bedaquiline. And so the baby had a continuation phase treatment with these agents, bedaquiline, delaminid, and clofazamine um, with some adjustments later. But what a super challenging case. And, um, you know, I mentioned congenital TB is quite rare And often I think this is a good reminder that you may not really be able to confirm TB in the infant. You're really going off of the history of the mom who probably has an evaluation or ultimately found to have genitourinary or disseminated TB, like in this case. Um, But this is the first reported use of bedaquiline and delaminid in this young of a child. So a very, very premature baby. Um, and so this was also my other way of saying we actually have a, another series of curious congenital conundrums that we're doing for febrile, and one of the cases is going to be a congenital TB. So hopefully if people want to learn more about how to think about the evaluation, um, we'll have a good episode your way in the next couple of weeks. Okay. So a nice plug. <laughs> Yes, right? (laughs) It also forces me to be accountable (laughs) and edit the episode and release it. Yes, yes. You you have now (laughs) publicly stated. (laughs) Yeah. All right. The fungal section, I've just got one this time, and I I know how... uh, I know how Sarah feels about this particular test, but the article, Emerging Roles of 1,3 Beta-D Glucan in Cerebral Spinal Fluid for Detection and Therapeutic Monitoring of Invasive Fungal Diseases of the Central Nervous System, recently published in CID. Um, This one has all the good stuff for me, fungi in the CNS, monitoring using an extract from the blue-blooded horseshoe crab. It's a short read and reviews uh, some of the publications in this area. My, I think, most popular (laughs) infographic is about fungal markers, and even though it's about serum fungal markers, uh, this always gets sent to me. (laughs) They say, you know, don't forget that it may have a role in the CSF. So even though I have a chart about blood biomarkers, I had to add a caveat about CSF. So now I can add this to my citations. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 
<laughs> All right. And parasitic. Be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Uh, no, no worms, uh, no carpet uh, python worms growing in anybody's head this time. But we do have the MMWR, Outbreak of Locally Acquired Mosquito Transmitted Autoxinous Malaria, Florida, Texas, May through July 2023. Interesting descriptions of the eight cases of locally acquired mosquito transmitted um, Plasmodium vivax malaria, which have been reported to CDC from state health departments in Florida and Texas during May 18th through July 17th, 2023. So in Texas, we had an imported case of P. vivax malaria, symptom onset May 2nd, um, was previously reported in the same area in Cameron County where the patient with autochthonous infection was likely exposed. So the thinking there might be that that person with malaria who got an autochthonous here without travel, it got a bite from a female Anopheles mosquito um, that had bit that other person that had come into the country with parasitemia. Now, down in Florida, all seven reported cases occurred in persons who live within a four-mile radius in Sarasota County. An imported case of Vivax malaria was also previously reported in the same immediate area. So um, may it, that may have been the introduction. All right, and we're going to close it out with a couple articles here in miscellaneous, one from each of us. I guess be sure to listen to This Week in Miscellaneous Things. We need a new <laughs> podcast. Now, here's the good one. The article, Complexity of Infectious Disease Compared to Other Cognitive Medical Specialties Published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Um, you know, I always have this thing, like, you know, with my wife and our son, Barnaby, when he runs in, in these cross-country races, and I always ask him, Barnaby, how'd you do? What was your time? My wife's like, don't ask him that. I'm like, it is a competitive sport. Well, apparently, <laughs> there's competition here among the specialties with regard to whose specialty is more complicated. Well, the methodology they use here is actually pretty interesting. So they report, the authors report, that they looked at content in UpToDate and enumerated its content to create a measure of breadth and complexity. They looked at the relative number of articles, society guidelines, FDA-approved new molecular entities. Not only do they suggest that infectious disease is an area of medicine with high complexity, but they suggest we might need more subspecialization in large <laughs> ID groups to handle this complexity and provide optimal care. Well, we always got to pull, pull these. Yeah, it's an interesting way to uh, judge complexity. But I mean, I can't say I disagree with the take home message. Um, and I will close us out. This article is from CID, Unintended Consequences, Risk of Opportunistic Infections Associated with Long-Term Glucocorticoid Therapies in Adults. Um this review starts with a really quick case and then uh, really describes the qualitative and quantitative immunosuppressive effects of long-term steroids, as well as describing recommendations for the um, prevention of acute or reactivation infections. And um, I think one of the keys here is really trying to have a better understanding of the true risks of, risks of infection. And the authors really reinforce this you know, this dose dependent model that we often focus on, you know, if your dose is higher, that you have more risk is maybe not a perfect way to accurately predict an individual's risk, um, because the degree of immunosuppression differs a bit between the glucocorticoids. So their primary figure is really excellent. But I really like table one, which has a breakdown of immunologic effects by the cell type. And then sort of as you move over in the columns to the far right, there's the uh, ultimately related clinical implications. And then table five had a, it's just a nice reference of the recommendations for preventing these types of opportunistic infections in patients on glucocorticoids. So these CID sort of state-of-the-art reviews are, are quite lovely. I saw there's a new one on acute encephalitis from just a couple of days ago that I actually haven't read yet, but I'm sure is great. Um, so if people, I think these are really great ones to save and then to share uh, with others when these questions come up, which they inevitably do <laughs> every time you're on service. 
Um, but yeah, I guess that brings us to the end of this podcast. So as always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts and at microbe.tv forward slash Puscast. We'd love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions. Just send those to Puscast at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on, I guess it's X now. I was going to say Twitter. <laughs> X at Dong at Federal Podcast, or you can find me at federalpodcast.com. And I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com or on that X thing at Daniel Griffin MD, <laughs> as well as on the other podcasts This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you, and dictation, and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious.